If y'all would take your Bibles and hold them up, and let's pray. Father, we come holding your word high and exalting you. We come today, Lord, to hear what you would say to us from heaven. And we pray, Lord, that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear. Lord, we know when there's difficulty with understanding your word, that it is not with your word. You have been clear, but it is with the hardness of our own hearts. And so we pray today that you would give us soft hearts that would receive your word and that would apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you would uh, join me in your Bibles in the book of 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians. It's about the middle of the New Testament. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. As we prepare this week for, uh, for Thanksgiving, uh, I thought it would be beneficial for us to look at what Scripture says about thankfulness. It's good to be reminded of these things. And in America, Thanksgiving is almost exclusively connected to the holiday. When we say the term Thanksgiving, we automatically think of the holiday. Um, Personally, it's my favorite holiday, but most of the year, we don't actually give much thought to the particular activity of giving thanks. In fact, most Americans, Thanksgiving isn't even, Thanksgiving Day isn't even an intentional time of giving thanks. It's really a preparation day for Christmas. It's almost like we bypass Thanksgiving straight for Christmas. It's on, on that day, on Thanksgiving, we, we are preparing to make a list of what we want, right? We, we begin the Christmas shopping season is where many people begin. They're looking for Christmas presents. Children are told to make Christmas lists and Black Friday deals go on sale Thursday afternoon. And so we begin feeding our, our greed. But this should not be so for Christians. Thankfulness should be as natural to Christians as prayer and worship and rejoicing. However, I'm not here to argue that we should do better as Christians in giving thanks this Thursday. We should, but it's more than that. In fact, I'm going to argue this morning that Thanksgiving should be a lifestyle for the Christian, a lifelong activity that we intentionally engage in, that we intentionally give thanks. It's actually what we're going to look at this morning is a three-part command that the Apostle Paul gives us. And these things, these three things we're going to look at are really make up what the Christian life is. These things could be synonyms for the Christian life. They go together like peanut butter and jelly sandwich, right? Or better, turkey and stuffing and gravy, right? They go go together, and they're supposed to be together. And you can't have one without the other. These three things are so connected and interwoven in the Christian life. And so let's look at these commands and see what Scripture has to say. You would stand. We're going to read 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 16 to 18. It says... Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. You can be seated. First of all, I want to point out that what Paul is giving us here is what's called an imperative command. An imperative command, it means it is something, it's not just a one-time thing that we do. It's something that we are to continuously do and not stop. It is an ongoing thing of obedience. This is not something that we do occasionally as it suits our lives or as it's convenient for us, but it is something that's supposed to be a normal part of being a Christian. And so the the heading in your bulletin, the top thing there is this. A Christian life should be marked by joyfulness, prayerfulness, and thankfulness. These things should distinguish the Christian life and set us apart from the rest of the world. These things are synonyms for what it means to live the Christian life. Notice how Paul refers to these things. He says, rejoice evermore. That means always. Pray without ceasing, without stopping. And then in everything, give thanks. These are not something that we do only when things are going our way and when life is smooth and trouble-free, when it's convenient. These are things that we do when life even when life is falling apart, even when there are difficulties and we're struggling and we're suffering. In fact, if you were to study the book of 1 Thessalonians, you would find that Paul is actually telling them to do this in the midst of their own trial and suffering. That Paul himself is suffering and struggling while he's telling them this. Right? Paul is not some out-of-touch optimist who thinks things is always unicorns and rainbows. <coughs> In fact, Paul is the one who said, 
All who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Paul knows the hardships of the Christian life. He knows them better than anybody. It was Paul's very call to the ministry from God through Ananias in Acts 9 who came to him and this is what the Lord said. The Lord said to Ananias, Go your way, for Paul is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel, for I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Paul's very call to being a Christian was a call to suffer. And so Paul understood the Christian life was about suffering. When Paul had came in the book of Acts <clears throat> to the town of Thessalonica, which is where the Thessalonians are, when he came there and preached the gospel, he was ran out of town. And he went to a place called Berea, and he started preaching there, and they received the word gladly. But some Jews from Thessalonica followed him to Berea, incited a riot against him, and Paul almost died. He had to flee for his life. And he turns around a couple of weeks after that and writes this letter to these believers. So Paul is not writing this as someone who's out of touch with suffering and trials and struggling. We're not being instructed to do something here from someone who doesn't know about the difficulties of the Christian life. Not only that, but the people Paul is writing to aren't exempt from sufferings and trials. If in chapter 3 of 1 Thessalonians, this is what Paul says to them. He says, I sent Timotheus, our brother, and minister of God, and, bro- and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ to establish you, to comfort you concerning your faith, that no man should be moved by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that you were appointed unto these things. Paul said he sent Timothy there to encourage them and to build them up in their faith because of their suffering and their trials. In fact, Paul says that it was their destiny to suffer. And not even just them, but all Christians. Our lives are destined in Christ to suffer. And yet, here in our text, Paul tells us that we are to rejoice evermore. That we are to pray without ceasing. And that we are in everything to give thanks. How can that be? If the Christian life is such a hard, difficult struggle. Well, that's what we're going to look at this morning. If you would look at verse 16 with me. Rejoice evermore. Rejoice always. If you remember, when we went through the book of Philippians last year, we saw that joy and happiness weren't the same thing. That happiness is ultimately dependent on circumstance. It comes and goes like the ocean tides. Happiness comes from outside. It's what we're influenced by from the external world. But joy comes from in our hearts. It comes from inside. Joy is not based on circumstances, but rises above the circumstances to see the eternal. Because joy is based on the hope that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. So, for example, we can grieve at a funeral and yet still have the joy of the Lord in our hearts. We can even wrestle in life with depression and have the joy of the Lord in our hearts. Because joy doesn't mean that I always have a smile on my face. Rather, it means that I have a perspective on life that says God is in control and He's going to work these things out. It's finding delight and refuge in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so number one in your notes is this. Christians should have a constant mood of joy because we have eternal rewards in Christ that no temporal suffering can touch. We should have a constant mood of joy in our hearts because no temporary trial or difficulty or suffering can take away what we've been given in Christ. Isn't that what Paul says in Romans 8? Where he says that all of these things, he talks about hardships and trials and difficulties and persecutions and even death may come against us, but they cannot separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. Or as he put it in Romans 8.18, For I reckon that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. That what we have awaiting us far outweighs the present trials that we have. And because of that, we can have joy. We can have joy in this moment knowing what the future holds in Christ. In fact, in Philippians 4.4, Paul says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Our great God commands us to rejoice. To have joy in Him. That means we're to be content. To find peace. To take refuge in Him. In the dark moments of our life, we run to Him. And we find our delight in Him. 
Melissa Kruger wrote this. She said, The bedrock of our rejoicing isn't the goodness of our day, but the goodness of our God. Our rejoicing isn't found in the circumstances of life, but in the Lord Jesus Christ. Did you know that Satan believes that Christians only rejoice, that God's people only rejoice because of God basically bribes them with good things? This is what we see in the book of Job, right? If you remember the beginning of Job, it says that Satan came before God and God points out Job to him and says, Have you behold my, my servant Job and seen how faithful he is? And Satan says, Well, of course he's faithful and worships you because look at all that you've given him. If you take it away, he'll curse you to your face. And so Satan believes that our joy is found because of the things that God gives us rather than in God himself. But I think the book of Job points out that Job doesn't feel that way. That Job still rejoices in the Lord even after everything is taken away. And so rejoicing is a way of actually instructing the devil about the goodness of God. It's like giving the devil a black eye. But our God re- commands us to rejoice. And then He strengthens us to do it. What a gracious God we have that He would command us to be a joyful people. That our God is a joyful God. He's full of delight. At His right hand, the Bible says, are joys and pleasures forevermore. So Christian, you are not allowed to sit there and sulk and pout. You are not allowed to be a complainer. You are commanded to rejoice in the Lord. And it gives a sour testimony about the Lord when we do gripe and complain. There in Philippians 4, I read to you just a moment ago, to rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. We see there that Christ is the great object of joy. Not rejoicing in the things of this world, but we rejoice in Christ. But we also see that Paul there says, Essentially, the same thing he says here. Rejoice always. And here he says, rejoice evermore. That means right now, we are to be rejoicing in the Lord. It's not that I need to to fix this or that in my life so that I can rejoice. Rejoice always. Rejoice evermore. The moment starts now. Not an hour from now, not this Thursday. We rejoice in the Lord now. In every circumstance, we rejoice. Not because we're ignoring our problems. Not because we're pretending that they're better than what they actually are, but because we always have a reason to rejoice. No matter how bad things are. Why? Because we have Christ. Because we have eternal life. Because we've been united to God. And we know Him. In fact, if everyone you loved turned their backs on you, If everything you held dear was destroyed and you had no other place to go but to sleep in a ditch, you still have reason to rejoice because you have Christ. That's what the Bible teaches us. That's where our joy and contentment is found. This joy and peace that the world can't understand because they live for their happiness in things. We have the joy of the Lord that rises above circumstances because it's based not on things here and now, but on eternity in Christ. That's where our delight and joy is found, in the eternal one. So where do you find delight? Is it in money? Is it in success? Careers? Is it in stuff? Is it in another person? Your delight should be in Christ. He is the source of joy. Your joy is in Him. No matter what the circumstances of life, you find yourself. So when life is hard and bad, rejoice in the Lord. When things are bleak and dark, rejoice in the Lord. When things are terrifying and unsure, rejoice in the Lord. Go to Him and look to Him and find joy because that will sustain you. Rejoice in Him when you have other things to rejoice in. When your health is good, when your bank account is overflowing, rejoice in the Lord. In the good moments in life, rejoice because every good and perfect gift comes from Him. In the dark days, look to Him and find the joy and the strength you need because the Bible says the joy of the Lord is our strength. So how do we make it through those difficult days? By looking to Him and rejoicing in Him. And if you determine to rejoice in Him in all your circumstances, you will find the peace of God sustaining you through it. So rejoice evermore. The second command that Paul gives us in verse 17, he says, pray without ceasing. Now the second command is oftentimes misunderstood. Paul is not telling us here that we should always be saying a prayer. That We should always be muttering prayers as we go through our day. That's that's not what Paul means. 
If that was what he was saying, then how would we live the Christian life at all? How would we do other things that the Bible commands us? How would we sleep? How would we tell other people about Jesus? How would we read our Bibles? How would we have a loving relationship with our spouse or our children if we were constantly 24-7 muttering a prayer? This means, firstly, to not give up in our praying. To pray continuously without losing heart. To not give up. To not quit. To ask and ask and ask until the Lord answers. But more than that, the word pray actually is a comprehensive word. We use it to mean specifically talking to God and maybe even making requests to God. But in the Bible, that's actually called supplication. Prayer covers that, but it covers a whole bunch of other things too. Prayer is a comprehensive word for deep communion with God. It's intercession for others. It's making supplication, asking for things we need. It means to praise Him. So earlier, when we were singing songs of praise to God, that was prayer. The word implies actually an attitude of the heart towards God more than the actual words that we use. Now, if you have an attitude in your heart of prayer towards God, you're going to also say prayers. You're going to go to God and make supplication and intercession. You're going to do those things. But the command here is not just walking around saying prayers 24-7. Right? There, there are people who can do a whole lot of praying and use very few words. And there are other people who use a whole lot of words and they do no praying at all. Right? Because prayer is an attitude of the heart. And so the point here to pray without ceasing is not to constantly utter prayers, but to constantly go to God in all circumstances. To look to Him. To trust in Him. To long for Him. That we, in our hearts, are always seeking Him. And to be closer to Him. J.B. Lightfoot put it this way. He said, It's not the moving of the lips, but in the elevation of the heart to God that is the essence of prayer. That our first reaction in a circumstance is to turn to Him, not to handle it ourselves. Like a a little kid who's scared will run to their, their parent, not because they're forced to, but because they trust them and because they love them. And in the same way, we should run to our Heavenly Father when we're in trials and we're in trouble because we trust Him, because we love Him. And we know that he loves us. And we live in a place where we have resources aplenty. We don't have to guess where our next meal is. In fact, I would be willing to wager that everyone in here probably has enough food in your house to last you at least a week. right? We're not wondering where our next meal is going to come from. We're not wondering where our clothes are going to come from or what we're going to be able to sleep tomorrow. Those things don't come into our minds. When I was in Kenya... And I was talking with some of those pastors there to hear the stories of God's provision for them was was convicting. To see their faith, the great faith that they had in the Lord, knowing that they have to live their life in dependence on Him. Hearing uh, Bernard's story about his family, uh, that they had went a few days without eating, and he woke his children up at 3 in the morning, and they began praying at 3 o'clock in the morning because they had not eaten, they had no money, they had no food, they had nothing. And he said they prayed for a few hours that morning, and His kids got ready to go to school. And then there was a knock at the door. And there was a neighbor who came and said, we had some extra food. We thought maybe you guys would use it. We didn't want to throw it out. God had provided. Answered their prayer. They had prayed through the night. God would provide for them. And they had learned that they need to pray. That they need to rely on God. But even here where we have plenty... We need to learn that we need God and that we need to pray. But more than just praying out of need, prayer should actually flow from our hearts because it's a love for God. We should run to Him because we love Him and we want to know Him. That should be the deepest longing of our heart, to draw near to Him. And so number two in your notes is this. Christians should have a constant spirit of prayer because we love God from our hearts and want to commune with Him. It flows from the inner man. Right? It's, it's more than just a self-discipline thing. Now, I'm, I'm a big supporter of self-discipline and that we should have a set-aside time to pray. I think that's important in our lives. And that's where we actually learn to pray and learn to trust God. But we need to nurture the desire to pray. We need to learn to love to pray. To actually do it because we love God. To learn that we need God and we need to trust Him with our lives. We need to cultivate that in our hearts. A desire to pray to God out of love for God. 
We need both things. We need a childlike dependence on him and we need an adult-like love for him. All right, we see this in Job. We know the story of Job, right? I told you part of it a minute ago. Job loses everything. Satan takes it all away, right? He loses his, his children. He loses his property. He loses his, his, his source of income. He loses everything in, in a matter of, of an hour, right? He loses it all. And we know the story. Job is obviously distraught. He's, he's even depressed. And his friends come and try to console him. And they don't really do a very good job of that. And the whole book goes on. But when we get to the end of the book, God actually commends Job for his prayer. And if you read Job's prayers, you would think, this doesn't seem like a very good prayer. But God commends Job for his prayers because of his trust and his love for God. That's why he went to God in prayer. He didn't turn his back on God when those things happened. He didn't blame God and get angry. He went to God, even in his confusion, and prayed. He poured out his heart before God. Job had learned to pray in his prayers. He didn't turn his back on God, but he kept running to God for help. He poured out his heart to God, even though he didn't understand what God was doing. But ultimately, he trusted him. And so we need to learn these things when we go through trials and struggles. In every season, in every time of life, we need to pray in our prayers. And the only way to learn that is first to discipline ourselves to pray. We have to set aside a time and learn to pray. The only way we learn to pray is by doing it. And then we have to grow in our love for God. And we do that through the reading of His Word. The more we learn about God, the more we love Him. And if we're looking to Jesus, and we're rejoicing in Him, and we're walking with an attitude, with a spirit of prayer, of love for God in our hearts, then guess what the fruit of our lips is going to be? Verse 18, In everything give thanks. In everything give thanks. This is how... We live a life of thankfulness. Paul starts his third command by saying, in everything, that is, in every circumstance, at all times. Now, the the other two commandments were continuous with relation to time, right? Rejoice evermore. Rejoice continuously in time. The second one was pray without ceasing. Don't stop praying. Don't stop with that attitude of prayer. But this one, he says, in everything. This is universal in its scope. It's not just in time, but in every circumstance, in every detail. To continue, no matter what is going on around you. This leaves no room in the Christian life for complaining. We don't meet the trials of this life with an emotionless attitude, right? Just pretending they don't exist. We don't ignore them, but we offer up heartfelt thanks to God in everything. Peter and James actually tell us to rejoice when we go through various trials and temptations. Because we understand that there is no such thing as an unnecessary trial for a believer. Because God is in control. Charles Spurgeon said it like this, The sovereignty of God is the pillow on which the Christian lays his head. It's how we rest. It's where we find joy. It's how we are thankful because we know that our God is in control. We're able to rest in the most dire circumstance because God is on the throne. And that all of those things are going to be worked out to the good and for His glory because God promised that He would. And so we can be thankful in everything because we serve a God who rules over all. And so the third thing in your notes is this. Christians should have a constant attitude of thankfulness because we trust God in every circumstance. We have a constant attitude of thankfulness. Constantly offering up thanks as an offering to God. This is an act of faith. We do this because we trust in God. Because even in the circumstances of life, we know He's in control, even when they're bad. This is why, in the Bible, unthankfulness often characterizes the lost. In Romans chapter 1, for example, Paul talks about these people who see the invisible, uh, they know that God exists, but they, they deny the truth about God. And he says in there, Because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful. In that list in 2 Timothy 3 where Paul is describing the last generation, that that most wicked generation that will exist, he says this in 2 Timothy 3, For men in those days should be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. Now we, We often don't think of unthankfulness as being grouped with those other sins. But the Bible lists them right there beside each other. 
Don't think of complaining as a minor thing, as being unthankful as something small. It is a terrible sin against God. Remember when Israel was at the doorstep of the promised land. They were going to go in and they sent some spies in and the spies came back and said, oh, the land is everything God said it would be. But there are large men there with fortified cities and there's no way that we can beat them. They had forgotten that God had already delivered them from the most powerful army of the time in Egypt. They had forgotten everything that God did. And so they started complaining. In fact, they said it would be better if we went back to Egypt and became slaves again. This is what Psalm 106 says about that. It says, Yea, they despise the pleasant land. They believe not His word, but they murmur, that is, they complain in their tents, and they hearken not unto the voice of the Lord. Therefore, He lifted up His hand against them to overthrow them in the wilderness. God punished them for it. The the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness for Israel was because they murmured against the Lord with their unthankfulness and their ungratitude. The Apostle Paul actually warns us in 1 Corinthians 10, talking about the same people. He says, But with many of them God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. These things are examples for us to the intent that we should not lust after evil things. Neither be idolaters, neither let us be fornicators, neither let us tempt Christ as they did, neither murmur as some of them murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Paul lists and warns of complaining in the same breath as fornication and idolatry. What a terrible sin this is. You must fight against this sin in your life. And the way that we fight against that is by cultivating a thankful heart. Keeping our hearts and our minds on the Lord. Rejoicing in Him. Living with a spirit of prayerfulness. Complaining is nothing more than questioning God. Every time you complain, you are making a statement about God. Either He is not doing what you think is best for you, or He is not able to do what you think is best for you. It's either God doesn't know, or God isn't strong enough. Complaining is being unhappy with God's ways. That the lot that He's given you in life is not good enough for you. Is He not all-knowing? Is He not the one who does all things well? Who are you to question God? Complaining is bringing into question what God has ordained. It is a mindset of the wicked that looks at their circumstances and says, I deserve better than this. It's like the question, and I'm sure y'all heard this before, I've heard this a million times. If God is all-powerful and good, then why does bad things happen? I heard one preacher say, I don't even answer that question anymore. And he said, because it's the wrong way to ask it. The question should be, if God is all-powerful and good, why am I alive today? I should have been killed last night in my sleep for my sin yesterday. If God is good, then why am I alive? I shouldn't even be here. See, that's the perspective that a Christian has. And when we have that perspective, we can look at life even in the terrible circumstances and we can find reason to be thankful because we deserve much worse than what's happening. We deserve hell for our sin and yet we have eternal life. There should be nothing in this life that can take away our gratitude. If that's our mindset, then Satan can't rattle us with the circumstances of this world. Another problem that we face with regard to being thankful and everything is that sometimes we grow so accustomed to goodness and the blessings of the Lord that we forget about them. We we almost are so used to it that we, we forget to even acknowledge it. Someone said, if the stars only came out one time a year, everyone would stay up all night to see them. But we're so used to them, we don't even bother to look. And it's like that with a lot of things in our lives. We're like the Israelites in the wilderness when God was feeding them supernaturally with bread from heaven. Miraculous bread. And the Bible says that after a while, they got tired of it. And they started complaining about it because they wanted something different. They had forgotten about the miracle that they were seeing. Bread rained down from heaven. And they began to complain against the Lord. How soon we forget what God has done for us. We must learn to be intentional in the giving of thanks. It's a sin not to. Don't forget what God has done. Don't lose hope by looking at your circumstances. Set your eyes on Him. Trust in Him. When we put our eyes on the circumstances, that causes us to get overwhelmed by them. 
We must fight and kill the sin of unthankfulness in our hearts. We must learn to be intentional in the giving of thanks. To guard ourselves against the unthankful heart. Is this a sin in your life that you need to repent? If you only were allowed to have today what you thanked God for yesterday, what would you have? What would you not have? Thankfulness should characterize the Christian. This should mark our lives. We should be known as grateful people. We shouldn't be known as complainers. We shouldn't be known as someone who's difficult to please, but as a person of gratitude. Now let me clarify before we move on really quick what this does not mean. Because there is a way to give thanks that is wrong. Right? An example of this is in the parable that Jesus tells of the Pharisee and the tax collector. You remember that Jesus said they both went to the temple to pray? And the Pharisee lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, I thank you, Lord, that I am not like that tax collector over there. Right? So, so just giving blanket thanks for things is not what the Bible is calling us to do. It's about our heart. It's about the, the motivation of our heart. We're not to be fake and just put on a show. True thankfulness is what we're being called to here from a heart that trusts in God, that loves God, and that truly sees that God is working in our lives. It flows from a life that finds joy in Christ and from a spirit of seeking the Lord that genuinely wants to praise Him. Right? This isn't teaching us that we have to thank God for a loved one dying or for a child who dies in a car accident who was hit by a drunk driver. We don't give thanks for sin. We don't pray and say, thank you, God, for the drunk driver sinning by, by being drunk and killing that family. We don't say that. This verse says, in everything give thanks, not for everything give thanks. This is not saying that we need to be insensitive to things and make blanket thanks for everything. It would be quite odd, for example, for us to give thanks for Satan. But it would be appropriate for us to thank God for using Satan to strengthen our faith. We can thank God for His power and His work in every circumstance, even if the circumstance is bad, right? So with the drunk driver, we, we don't pray, thank you God for the drunk driver sinning and killing the, 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 the family. We would say, thank you God that you have used this terrible circumstance of a drunk driver and this family dying to work in people's lives, to bring our community together, so on and so forth. We find how God is using the circumstance for the good, and then we thank Him for that. We can find things in bad circumstances to be thankful for because we know that God is at work in it, because He promised that He would be. So next time you face a trial or a heartache, instead of complaining about it, it doesn't do anything anyway, find a reason to give thanks. See how God is using that to, to make things better, to work it to the good. But this is not just simply forced optimism. Right? What, what's the cliche that we say when, when something bad happens? Well, it could be worse, right? There's nothing wrong with saying that, but that's not what we're being told to do here. We are being told here to actually offer up thanks to God as a way of praising Him. For example, Helen Keller. You remember you know who Helen Keller is? She was born blind and deaf. This is what she said. It fills my heart with joy to know that God loves me so much that He wishes me to live always. That He gives me everything that makes me happy. Loving friends, a precious little sister, sweet flowers and the warm sunshine, and best of all, a mind that can think and enjoy and a heart that can love and sympathize. Now most people in her situation would be depressed, maybe even angry at God. But she found reason to be thankful. It's like one of my favorite stories of one of my favorite Puritans, Matthew Henry. He, he was once robbed on the street. And he goes into his home after being robbed and writes in his journal, he writes this, Let me be thankful. First, because I was never robbed before. Second, because although they took my wallet, they didn't take my life. Third, let me be thankful because although they took my all, it was not much. And fourth, because it was I who was robbed and not I who robbed. That's the heart of a Christian who is thankful to the Lord in all circumstances. Let us endeavor in everything to be thankful. Let me point out to you at the end of verse 18. He says, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. He says, This is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. To rejoice in Him, to live with a spirit of prayer, and in everything to give thanks. That is the will of God for you. 
Now, he says here, he says you, that is a, a plural word uh, that means not just individual, but corporately. So this isn't just something that we should be known as individually. We should be known as joyful, thankful, prayerful people individually, but we should also be known that as a church. Our church should be known in our community as being a joyful, thankful, and prayerful people. And so let us seek to be that. But let me point out to you here, and this will be in the end, the argument that Paul is making here is not, you must do this for it is God's will. The argument is this, knowing that it is God's will for you to rejoice, to pray, and to be thankful, you can do it. God is going to empower you to do it because God doesn't put anything on you that he doesn't empower you to do. He's not going to command you to do something he doesn't equip you to do. And so number four, we are able to live this Christian life because it is God's will for us to do so through Christ Jesus. We are able to live this Christian life, joyfulness, prayerfulness, thankfulness, because it is God's will for us in Christ Jesus. God will empower us to do it. And so these things are not out of reach for you. Yet you you must be diligent to, to work out what God has worked in. The idea here is that God's will through His Son is that we be thankful, that we be joyful, and that we be prayerful. And if we would submit to the will of God, then we will learn those things. We will learn to be joyful and thankful and prayerful in everything in every season. D. Edmund Hebert said, He who can say amen to the will of God in his heart will be able to say hallelujah also. When we can submit to the will of God, then we can learn in every circumstance to say hallelujah and praise the Lord. So in everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we offer up to you, Lord, repentance and confession for our own hearts, Lord, that we have not been thankful in everything, that we haven't always rejoiced and that we don't always have a spirit of prayer. Lord, we pray that you would help us to be these things. Lord, we want to do them, not just because you've commanded us to do it, but Lord, because you said you would help us to do it. And so Lord, we pray that you would help us, that you would strengthen us through your spirit to be this kind of Christian, to live this Christian life. Lord, I pray that you would do this for us in Jesus' name. Amen.